thank you for sharing your conceiving hood journey and tell us why partnering with this initiative, especially during infertility awareness week was such a priority for you. You know, it was so, so I immediately jumped at, at, at signing on and then I didn't really realize the impact it would have on me personally. Um, because it's not something I've really spoken openly about. Um, I, I began my journey 10 years ago. There wasn't really a huge community out there. There weren't many people I could talk to about, um, about infertility, about my, my, about my difficulty in conceiving about my having to eventually um, partner with the gestational surrogate in order to have my boys. Um, but I think the, the thing that's, that's the, that's great about the conceiving hood campaign that clear blues created is it's not just motherhood because we are always focusing on oh okay becoming a mommy and what's it like to raise a child and we don't discuss the journey and getting there and the emotional journey that 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 can that that takes place and and what you have to do to take care of yourself and that's something i really wanted to talk about and it's actually been really healing to be so open and to see the response that's come in and and i feel like it's wonderful to be able to talk to other women and and hopefully help them yeah absolutely and there seems to be at least an increasing public focus on normalizing this process and the mm -hmm. many forms it takes that wasn't the case until relatively recently totally. how challenging was it to find the community and support that you needed when you were going through this um, it was challenging because I, I didn't really find community. I had, um, uh, I spoke to many doctors. I spoke to many, I mean, obviously I had my family, but they didn't know exactly what I was going through. Most of my friends were getting pregnant super easily. Um, and so, so I didn't really, and I, I would of course go on message boards, but that's also, you're kind of in a vacuum there and, and I, I felt like that was very specific. Um, so my partner was really my gestational surrogate who, who guided me through a lot of it and who was a wonderful partner through my journey. Um, but even today on the panel, hearing Devin and Asha's story and hearing about uh, their heartbreak and then how they get through it and then hearing Kara's story and and I love that she was brave enough to document all these negative tests and then finally a positive test. And I think putting that vulnerability forward and, and not being afraid to be like, this is real. This is what a lot of us go through, regardless of age, regardless of where we live. Like, it's just something that's happening now. And we have to, we're doing ourselves a disservice by not talking about it because there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just something that you know, some of us have to go through. So there's a lot, I think in community, there's so much strength and um, it's just, it's been, it's been a really wonderful thing to be a part of. Yeah, you mentioned the, the healing aspect of it. And in addition to yourself and your other panelists, other celebrities like Meghan Markle, Chrissy Teigen, the Kardashians have all talked about their experiences with pregnancy loss, IVF surrogacy. What inspired you to use your platform in a way to want to help women and other hopeful parents know they're not alone and avoid that isolation? Mm -hmm. Well, so a couple of years ago, women started um, reaching out to me being like, you know, I have a friend of friend who's going through something similar and is going to have to go through gestational surrogacy. Would you be willing to talk to her? And I'm like, absolutely. Like, give her my number and I'm, I'll take her through what worked for me. And then, you know, she can take from that what she would like. And so I, I've slowly started to um to share whatever i could with women who are going through the same thing but then given the opportunity to do it in a more public manner was presented to me through clear blue and i just i jumped at it because i didn't have the same thing 10 years ago i i think sur gestational surrogacy was not i mean i don't think it'll ever be the norm but it wasn't it wasn't something that that I knew a ton about. I didn't know a ton about um, fertility struggles. I had to, I sort of relied on, on my nurse at the time to, to guide me through it and give me advice. And I think it would have been really helpful to talk to like-minded women who were of similar ages who would be like, you know, this worked for me or this didn't work for me or just to know, oh my gosh, I'm not I'm not alone in this. I think that would have been really helpful. So I hope that women going through through their journey now will feel like, okay, I can, I can take this on because I'm not alone. 
And there's so many different options and so many ways to find that happy ending and what you're looking mm -hmm. for, right? Um, you've mentioned that one aspect of your experience was shame and self-judgment and the assumption that others were judging you. I think many mm -hmm. people can relate to that. How did you learn to let go of that? Um, time. I think it's, it was really time and it was also, I think I felt shame and self-judgment because I didn't go, I, I wasn't able to go the conventional route, right? So it was, it was this story I created about, oh, all the other moms are judging me because I wasn't able to carry. And so they think I'm less than, and they're probably all looking at me like I'm weird. And, um, and I just carried that with me like a burden for so long. And then when, when we had Rowan, it was a very different experience. It felt lighter in a way because I had already gone through it the first time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to relish this as best I can. And some of the guilt had just dissipated. And I think the funny thing about motherhood is you don't really know what to expect and you prepare and prepare and prepare. But then it, it's, it's this um, really intense thing where you can be really hard on yourself and you want to do everything perfectly. And I certainly was. And I'm letting go of that gradually. And so I, I would have to say time. I wish I could say, well, I realized I was being hard on myself and I did therapy and that took care of that. But it's, it's really just been a journey. And, and some of the good news is that it is an ongoing process and you have the resources and the tools to continue digging deeper into that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you believe is the biggest misconception out there about conceiving challenges that you'd like to help clarify? So the biggest misconception I had was, um, well, I, it began with, okay, I'm 30, I'm healthy, my, my, the women in my family are all fertile, so I should be fertile, Myrtle, and let's go. Um, so that was number one. And then two was that when you do seek the health, help of a doctor, that it's going to be sort of this like very easy um, route where, okay, now that science is involved, there's going to be no, no guesswork. And, and, you know, it took me like seven rounds of IVF in total. And, and there were some rounds where it was just like, who knew why you're your, my follicles, I keep going like this for follicles. It's really awkward, <laughs> but that's what I kept seeing on the sonogram. Um, who knew why they weren't synced up? Who knew why, you know, my left side wasn't acting like my right side and my ovaries just weren't complying. Um, so this idea that like science is going to fix it all, I think it's still kind of a, a little bit of a guessing game. And that's why Clear Blue's fertility tracker is so helpful. And that's why I think, I think you have to be so proactive and you have to be your own advocate and you have to interview doctors and you have to, you absolutely have to, I don't wanna say take control because I don't think it's good to like take control, but you do have to advocate for yourself and, and, and be in it for the long haul and, and not say, not put that pressure on yourself. Like, oh my gosh, I remember, I remember I was giving myself timelines and I was telling myself, okay, so I'm going to get pregnant by like September and then I'm going to give birth and then I'll, and then I can start work again. And I, I think as women and as, as working women, we just have this notion that we can control everything and control our schedule. And like, that's we love not, making plans. It's not, that's not really how it works. So you have to, I think you do yourself a huge favor if you let go of some of that, which is extremely difficult. Um, I cannot even remember what your question was because now I went off on this tangent. But um, oh, we got there. Was the what the biggest misconception that you wanted to clear yeah, up? Yeah, there's a lot that's of them. The biggest misconception is that is that once you go that route, that it's all going to be easy from there, and and it's it's not. Yeah, an open mind, self care, kindness, self care, yourself. take your time. Yeah, yeah. Well, your boys are now four and seven. How are four you? Four and seven. Yes. This topic with them. You know, that's a really, really good question. I, um, I've always wanted to be super open and, and my oldest son, Julian is like seven going on 40 and he's also really intuitive. So he just picks up on stuff and, and sometimes he tricks me. He's like, mommy, when you gave birth to me and I'm like, 
And he's like, oh, just kidding. I know that you didn't. And I'm just like, Julia, like, what is what's up with you? But I was very upfront. I explained that mommy and daddy created you and that I wasn't able to carry you. And then, you know, um, someone else carried you. But it was very tricky because I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to, to tell him and to that, that it was always part of his story rather it being something i sprung on him later in life because it's such a, it was such a huge gift it was such a huge blessing that i was able to have him um let alone have him this way so i just wanted it to be normalized for him um and i've but i did look at a bunch of children's books and i was like let me try to like find something that explains this in a through a kid's lens and i couldn't find anything that was appropriate so I kind of flubbered my way through it. They know more than we think they do, you know? They do. They pick up on it. Um, yeah. Well, before we let you go, we are also excited to see you reunite with your on-screen family this summer, Fast 9. It's finally happening. Uh, we recently talked to Michelle about this sequel bringing on a female writer and letting mm -hmm. women really step into the forefront in a major new way. How exciting mm -hmm. was it for you to return to the franchise at this particular moment? and? let's see Mia dig back into some action scenes, right? Yes, that was, it was really, really fun to dig into action. It was really fun to have scenes with Michelle because we really haven't gotten those um, in, in the history of the franchise, which is crazy because it's the 20th anniversary this year, which is amazing. Um, and I've always loved Michelle's and admired Michelle's courage. She always stands up for herself. She's always, you know, and also standing up for the right thing, whereas I'm always a little more afraid to speak up. And I'm learning a lot from watching her and I'm learning a lot from just, I'm I just, just working with her. So it's really fun for the girls to step into the spotlight a bit more and, and kick some butt. I really yeah, love absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, Mia and Brian got that beautiful send off in Furious 7 and Paul's mm -hmm. legacy uh, has always lived on in such a meaningful way on and off screen. We see his character briefly in the Fast 9 trailer. With Mia now coming back, how did you and your castmates acknowledge his memory on set? How was that vibe? We don't, there's never um, a formal acknowledgement of his memory on set because he's always there um, with us. And and yeah, he's he's not, I think Paul's presence is not something that comes and goes. He's always there regardless. Yeah, of course. and. Have you shown any of the fast movies to your boys yet? Are they not quite ready? Yeah, uh, <laughs> a thousand percent. Julian has watched all of them. He's in the movie for a second, which is really fun for him. Um, we know, and, yeah, Vin, Vin's son got to be in it as well. So it's really, yes. everything is coming full circle with everyone's kids now joining the fold. Totally, totally. I mean, it's such a wonderful legacy to be a part of. And, and it's like the one time he's actually really proud of me. He's like, mommy, you don't work. Like, I was like, guys, you have to get out of here. I'm working this morning. And they're like, Psh, you're working, what? And I'm like, <laughs> it's really funny. So when I get to show them like a finished movie, they're they're legit proud. So I'm very excited for them to come to the premiere as well. well Not Rowan, but Julian will. Yeah, definitely. And we're excited to see uh, the whole family get back together on screen. And thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, you. so many other women and hopeful parents can relate to this. And thank you for your time. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you.